And very often the bank staff are actually nurses employed by the National Health Service. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Alex Neil on an update on Ebola. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Alex Neil, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to update Parliament today on the important issue of Ebola. Members will be aware that we've responded to questions in the Chamber on this subject earlier this year. And last week, I provided an update in writing to the Opposition Health Spokespeople and the Health and Sport Committee. However, the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa is an issue of such international importance, it is right and proper that I make a statement to provide reassurance on where Scotland stands. The situation in West Africa is grave. What we are seeing is nothing short of a public health disaster in the affected countries. The World Health Organization publishes weekly updates on cases and deaths. The latest information from the 25th of October is that there have been a total of, of 10,141 cases of Ebola with 4,922 deaths. Historically, the disease has been confined to rural and more dispersed communities in Central Africa where it cannot easily take hold. But the outbreak in West Africa is affecting urban communities with large, densely packed populations. Areas where people move about regularly and countries to varying degrees with challenges around health infrastructure and leadership. Once Ebola had a finger hold in this part of the continent earlier this year, it did begin to spread very rapidly. There is no sign yet that the epidemic is under control, but Scotland will play our full part in contributing to the international effort, along with our friends in the rest of the UK and elsewhere, to bring it under control in West Africa. Uh, already I'm aware of more than 50 professionals from NHS Scotland who have already offered to help and in some cases are in situ in West Africa. It is likely more support will be needed and I've written to the NHS Chief Executives on the 16th of October to reiterate our support for volunteers and to particularly identify the need for more nurses and lab technicians. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Scottish aid workers operating in the region and the many healthcare workers and other staff who have expressed a willingness to volunteer in West Africa. Clearly, we need to know that any of our volunteers travelling to West Africa will be safe and in partnership with Health Protection Scotland, I am reassured that robust arrangements are in place to do this. We know who's going to West Africa. We know uh, they will be trained well before they go and when they arrive. We're confident they'll be looked after when they're there. And we know they will be monitored and supported when they return. Within Scotland, we're lucky enough to have the resources and infrastructure and the public health expertise and experience to put us in a good position to deal with any serious infectious diseases. But we're not complacent. There has been an increase in concern about Ebola in the last few weeks prompted by the reports of transmissions of the disease to healthcare staff in Spain and the United States. However, it is important we understand the reality of the risk. The fear of Ebola can be more infectious than the virus itself. The risk of a case arriving in Scotland is very low. There are no direct flights to Scotland from the affected countries and robust exit screening is now in place in the three affected countries. Entrance screening is in place at Heathrow and Gatwick, as well as in key European hubs such as Paris and Brussels. Even if a case does appear within Scotland or the UK, it is very unlikely we'll see any transmission of the virus. The disease can only be caught through blood and other body fluids, and affected individuals will be unwell and have a fever and other symptoms that are not infectious, but which will lead them to health care well before they're likely to pass the virus to other people. Indeed, the greatest risk of Ebola is to healthcare workers because they are more likely to come into contact with body fluids when treating a patient. So we must keep the risks in perspective, but we must also be ready to respond. And that's why we've been working with the NHS to ensure they are prepared and ready. My colleague Michael Matheson, the Minister for Public Health, has led this work since early summer when he met personally with experts from Health Protection Scotland. Following this, we established a viral hemorrhagic fevers national group chaired by Health Protection Scotland to ensure all the necessary arrangements and contingency plans are in place. 
That group met for the first time in August, and since last week, the group has started meeting on a weekly basis. Given the importance of ensuring we can quickly identify and diagnose possible cases of Ebola, we have provided funding to NHS Lothian to introduce a national testing service for viral hemorrhagic fevers in Scotland. That service, which will be in place from the 1st of December, means that blood samples will no longer need to be sent to the south of England for testing, and we will have the results more quickly. We're also working closely with the infectious disease clinical community to ensure the facilities and resources are in place to rapidly respond to a potential case. Our main infectious disease units in Glasgow and Lanarkshire in the west, Edinburgh in the east, and Aberdeen in the north are ready to operate as regional centres of expertise, providing advice, advice to other local hospitals or clinicians as needed, and managing possible cases. Our many other infectious disease specialists and wards around Scotland are also ready to respond if needed. I'm confident that we're ready to safely manage any possible case should one emerge. And indeed, we've already shown that our health boards, working with the Scottish Ambulance Service and others, can safely manage these, these types of infections. We safely managed a case of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever in Glasgow in 2012. We have 14 isolation rooms available to manage patients with Ebola in the three regional infectious disease units in Scotland and access to many more specialist facilities across the UK. An important strand of our work is ensuring that everybody across the National Health Service in Scotland and any other relevant professionals have all the information they need as well. And I'm grateful to Health Protection Scotland and the other professionals involved for all the work they've done in the past few months to update the many different pieces of guidance and technical advice in relation to Ebola. This information is all available on the Health Protection Scotland website and I would encourage all health professionals to ensure they're familiar with the content there. It is very likely that any questions they may have will already have been answered on the website. I've already mentioned the entry screening in place in the UK and European hubs. I am in regular contact with my ministerial contacts in the rest of the UK in both the Scotland office and the Department of Health, and we will keep under review the need for any additional entry screening, including in Scotland. I'm not yet convinced that this is proportionate or necessary, but I am ready to implement screening if our assessment changes. We also have to make sure that our international partners across Europe are keeping under review the question of screening and other public health measures. Discussions are already taking place at a European level in all these matters. We're also working with the oil and gas industry to ensure that any of our oil and gas workers coming or going to affected countries will have access to the same type and quality of monitoring arrangements which are in place for medical volunteers. That international joined up approach is vital if we are to successfully tackle this outbreak. Across the world, countries need to pull together and we in Scotland are keen to play our part. Earlier this year, this government donated half a million pounds to the World Health, World Health Organization's Ebola response. This was not a one-off gesture. Last week, I announced an additional donation of 300,000 pounds worth of medical equipment and supplies to West Africa from Scotland. This includes, includes over 100,000 respirators and 1 million disposable aprons, which will be distributed to charities running clinics in Sierra Leone. I will continue to ensure we offer every assistance we can to the international effort. The best way for us to protect the public health in Scotland is to support the efforts underway in West Africa. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I hope I provided the sufficient reassurance that we're monitoring this situation closely and we take the public health of Scotland very seriously. The Government's Resilience Committee score, chaired by the First Minister, has already met three times on this matter. This has provided an opportunity for us to engage with the Scottish experts and to ensure direct government oversight of our preparedness. We will continue to be vigilant and alert and we will maintain our links with other parts of the UK to ensure a joined up approach. The public should be reassured that the risk of Ebola coming to Scotland is still very low, but it, if it does arrive here, the National Health Service is ready to respond and public health will be protected. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. 
I intend to allow around 20 minutes for uh, questions, after which we move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary were to press the request to speak button now. And I call Neil Findlay. Thanks, President Officer. And can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary very much for his uh, uh, comprehensive statement and his response to my earlier letter uh, appealing for MSPs to be kept updated on Ebola and any impact on Scotland or Scots. Can I pay uh, a tribute, first of all, to the 50 NHS professionals uh, working in the affected region and to the NGOs and their volunteers there. They are doing uh, tremendous work in a very difficult uh, situation. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary about the level of training uh, being provided to staff uh, on dealing with the disease uh, prior to them entering the uh, uh, affected area and, and, and indeed leaving for the affected area? What uh, uh, support will be provided to them uh, when there and indeed on their return? And can I also ask what um, support and cooperation is being given to Scottish African charities working here and with people in uh, Sierra Leone uh, to help prevent the spread of the disease and deal with the consequences of it? Um, today I met with representatives of um, some of those Scottish African charities uh, and they asked me if I could put forward a request to the Minister for a meeting with them uh, so that they could discuss ways in which uh, they could work together with the Scottish Government uh, uh, in order to um, help deal with the situation on the ground uh, and some of the consequences of that, including things like education. Um, I would really appreciate if the Minister could take me up on that offer. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, uh, both myself and my colleagues Michael Matheson and Humza Yousaf are planning to meet with the NGOs involved uh, and indeed with other organisations whose support we require because uh, while some of them may not be NGOs working in Africa, some of them may be organisations that nevertheless can help with the supply of material. We've now received a re request from Oxfam for additional support as well as the DFED list which we are working our way through. So we would be more than happy and we're planning to meet the NGOs and indeed others as well. This has to be a joint effort. It's not just about the Scottish Government, it's about all the people who can make a contribution. In terms of the staff who've gone, first of all, can I say the number of staff, the latest I have is 59 staff have volunteered uh, from Scotland, 31 of them are doctors, 17 are nurses, 7 are paramedics, 3 are lab technicians, uh, and one is uh, of an unknown skill, but nevertheless volunteered. Uh, prior to an assignment in West Africa, these healthcare workers participate in a three-stage training program. Five days of training undertaken in a facility in the UK, three days of training in the relevant facility on arrival in West Africa, which in our case will be Sierra Leone, because part of the international agreement is that the UK government will lead the effort internationally in Sierra Leone. Other governments, such as the United States, are leading the effort, for example, in Liberia. So we obviously have agreed with the UK government that we will focus our efforts in support of them in Sierra Leone, uh, which we uh, are doing. Uh, the arrangements in terms of monitoring their health care in situ uh, are under the auspices of Public Health England. It's been agreed by the four administrations in the UK that the lead agency in, in coordinating this and the conduit for all of this will be Public Health England. Uh, and they've offered to register any aid worker from the UK wherever they're based and they're doing, as, as they're doing with NHS uh, volunteers from across the UK. Uh, they register the aid worker before they leave, they track them when they're there, they perform a risk assessment on the return as regards exposure to Ebola, and they set up a monitoring system as well. Uh, and I believe there's a total of 12 beds allocated within Sierra Leone, which is ring fence for any health worker working in the area, not just UK health workers, working in the area who happens to contact Ebola. Uh, I'm happy to send uh, any member more details because I do have volumes of details uh, on uh, how these arrangements, uh, but I can assure, both, assure the Chamber, both in terms of the training and in terms of looking after the health and well-being of the volunteers when they're in the countries, uh, we now have a very comprehensive package, which is a similar package to that for the rest of the UK. Annette Milne, followed by Linda Fabiani. Thank you. I welcome the statement bringing us up to date with action being taken to combat the Ebola outbreak and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy of the statement. I'd also add my thanks to all the healthcare professionals who have volunteered to go and help in affected areas. 
The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of recent comments made by Dr Devi Sherdar, Senior Lecturer in Global Health Policy at Edinburgh University, that my home city of Aberdeen is, if Ebola comes to Scotland, likely to be an area at risk, given its airport and concentration of population with international connections. As Aberdeen Royal Infirmary is one of the four centres in Scotland with a dedicated infection diseases unit, will he ensure that it receives adequate resources and support should there be a case of Ebola in the North East? Also, as a North East member, I clearly welcome his comments that he's working closely with the oil and gas industry to protect workers in that industry. Is he fully confident that the necessary precautions are in place for those engaged in countries overseas affected by the virus when they return to the UK? And furthermore, will workers returning from such countries be prohibited from going on to installations within the North Sea until it can be certain that they've not been infected with the virus? The presiding officer, I'm happy to reassure the member on a whole host of points there. First of all, dealing with the last point first, uh, we've agreed with the oil and gas sector that no worker returning from one of these countries will go back in an oil rig in less than 21 days of arriving in the country. And the reason for the 21 days is, of course, that's the incubation period uh, for Ebola. In terms, if I can just very quickly take you through uh, the processes that each oil worker will go through coming from West Africa to the UK, because I think that's obviously where the main risk might be, and obviously within Scotland, Aberdeen, in terms of oil workers, uh, would be the area that would be most likely to be affected. Uh, first of all, there is an exit screening process, so before anybody leaves any of these countries, they go through a full screening process. If they show any signs of the disease whatsoever, then clinical judgments are made about, and to date, with one exception, uh, all those suspected of Ebola have been treated in the country and not travelled. And again, that's under very much the control of the UK government and is in agreement both with the countries they affected as well as as part of the, the practice being adopted internationally. So if any oil worker is suspected of having Ebola, the likelihood is the clinical decision would be made to keep them in country and to deal with them there and to ensure that they get the same treatment in the country that they would get if they were at home in the UK. To date, only one case, which was not an oil worker, as you know, came to London and the chap, he was a nurse, and he successfully recovered from Ebola. Uh, once the oil worker goes through exit screening, and assuming they have not uh, been identified as possibly having Ebola, they then get on the flight. Now, there are a number of connecting flights uh, through Casablanca, Brussels, uh, are two of the main ones, Paris, I think are the three main routes from West Africa into the UK. And obviously those flights then go into the primarily Heathrow and a small number go into Gatwick. In a small number of cases, they go to St Pancras, where there's also a screening process. So anyone arriving at Heathrow, Gatwick or St, Pan St Pancras who has been to one of these countries will go through an entry screening process. If they have a temperature at all, or if there is any worry in, at all, particularly, but even if they have recently been in the country, there is then a tracking process. So they're followed up and monitored for the period up to the 21 dates. Uh, and particularly with oil workers, we are working very closely with Oil & Gas UK, with the industry, because there are two companies who are operating in the North Sea who are also operating in the region, although most of the oil in that region is actually in Nigeria, which is now Ebola-free. So again, the risk should be absolutely minimal, but just in case, we're, operating, we're working very closely with the oil companies, particularly the two that have uh, uh, installations both in the North Sea and in West Africa, and we're working very closely, obviously, with the Grampian Health Board to make sure that all the facilities are in place in Aberdeen to absolutely minimise any chance of any oil worker, or indeed anyone else, um, con contacting Ebola. And the Fabiani, followed by Richard Simpson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I was very pleased to hear that the Scottish Government is working along with so many others, but what we're talking about is, is very much a reactive situation. And, and there have been discussions about whether, in fact, the international community was caught a bit off guard in this. What I'm interested in knowing about is, with the recognition that it's always better to be preventative in such things in developing countries, what kind of ongoing research uh, collaboratively, internationally, and uh, what kind of ongoing um, information and training programmes in-country that have been affected 
uh, will be put in place or discussions taking place about that just now because there are many, many reasons, uh, including some which are cultural as well as health infrastructure, why these diseases can't be contained quickly when they break out. Well, there are many initiatives going on in country. For example, one of the problems is the cultural um, opposition in these countries to cremation of dead bodies. And therefore, the burial of these dead bodies means that there is a particular risk uh, from that kind of internment. And clearly, there are initiatives going on to try to deal with that to minimise any risk because of the cultural problems arising from wide-scale um, cremation. In terms of uh, the wider picture, uh, first of all, I didn't mention the vaccines. Um, we Two, two points, I think, to make about vaccines. First of all, first of all there are two vaccines which are about ready to, for distribution uh, at the turn of the year. Now, initially, it will be probably in small numbers, probably about 20,000 units in January, but leading to over a million units by April. Uh, as people will be aware, there has been a global agreement to fast-track uh, the approval process for these vaccines because if we had to wait for them to go through the normal processes, it would probably take years before we could actually use the vaccines. However, there has been global agreement, uh, and the most advanced one is one being produced by GSK, but there's also, I believe, a Canadian vaccine, which is also about ready to go. Now, obviously, there'll be some tests on these vaccines before they're finally used, particularly to look at side effects and so on. But the good news is that there's now a high expectation that there will be a vaccine available at some point in the first half of 2015. And it's all also been agreed globally, I think very sensibly, that the top priority group, obviously, for vaccination will be the health workers working in these West African countries for obvious reasons. In terms of ZMAP, which is also a uh, drug that received wide-scale publicity, uh, the jury, I think, is out in terms of its effectiveness. In any case, there is currently no supply worldwide anymore of ZMAP. The last uh, supply was used up by a Norwegian patient, I think, two weeks ago, because it's based on growing plants, and the plants take some time to grow. But there is a lot of effort going on internationally, both to look uh, at the safety of the vaccines and make them widely available as early as possible, but also to look at possible cures for Ebola. So I think in amongst all the bad news, there is a degree of optimism that hopefully by this time next year, we will have vaccines available uh, and they will be widespread and particularly available in West Africa. Can I uh, join others in thanking the Cabinet Secretary for the comprehensive statement and the clarity with which this issue is being tackled? Uh, it's, I think it's good that our services already had experience of a Crimea Congo hemorrhagic fever. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what risk assessment has been made of the demand of the 14 isolation rooms and associated equipment in a normal winter? Um, with the predictions that this outbreak could well last into 2016 and the growth curve is not going to stop until at least the summer of next year. And can I also ask what training and equipment is being made available to ambulance workers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presenting officer, we're actually engaged in finalising a, a contingency plan for worst case scenario so that if we do end up in a situation where there's much higher demand and we do end up with more than well, any case, but particularly if we get more than one case, so that we can cope in Scotland. Now, obviously, the procedure that's in place at the moment is that anyone who's been identified as being infected by Ebola coming from West Africa, if the clinical decision, and it will be a clinical decision uh, to transport them to the UK, they would initially go to the Royal Free Hospital in London. Irrespective of where they live or where their destination is, if they have already been diagnosed with having Ebola, they will go to the Royal Free in London under current arrangements. And, and then, once it's appropriate, they would then be transported to one of the infectious disease units in Scotland. Uh, and we have put in place, there's already in place actually, um, a whole host of procedures and training, uh, not specifically for Ebola, but for hemorrhagic fevers. And that was uh, upped quite considerably two years ago when we had the Crimean Congo case. And my colleague, as I said, Michael Matheson, 
has been working on this with all the professionals uh, since the start of the summer and training and risk assessment, all of that is built into the work that's ongoing right across the board. Can I just say that um, we have very little time left for questions on this uh, important statement. I would appreciate um, short questions and um, short answers, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, Bob Doris, followed by Jim Hume. Officer, uh, can I commend the Scottish Government on preparedness uh, in relation to this matter, but um, can I just check that there are various areas where Ebola could, could in theory, spread, such as schools and the higher education establishment within Scotland, whilst and theoretically the, the chances are very limited. Have you been in contact with the uh, higher, further education establishments and, and schools within Scotland to see what actions they would need to take to, to play their part? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, absolutely, Presiding Officer. Uh, we have been in touch through local authorities, with schools, with every college and with every university in Scotland. And with particular attention, we have uh, estimated and been in indirect contact through the University or College with the 30 students who are studying in Scotland uh, who are from West Africa, from the affected countries. So we actually are in touch with them uh, via their college or stroke university to make sure that they are very well aware of the risks and particularly to let us know if they or any of their friends or family are travelling to or from West Africa so that we can monitor their situation as well. So we have categorised the highest risk categories of people. Oil and gas workers are obviously top of the list because of the volume. Students and indigenous population, uh, is, which is also small in number, but again, uh, we're in touch with uh, uh, the, those people. GPs, every GP in Scotland has been made aware by the acting chief medical officer of what needs to be done if in any way Ebola is suspected, uh, as well as uh, the appropriate other outlets. So I think we've covered every possible avenue, presiding officer, and the acting chief medical officer will be reminding people on a regular basis until the, any potential threat from Ebola is completely eradicated. Jim Pugh, so followed by Gold Patterson. I, th I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement and also uh, I'd like to express my uh, thanks to the NH staff and others who have, not without risk to themselves, uh, volunteered to go out to tackle uh, Ebola. The Minister stated that he doesn't believe it would be proportionate to ne or necessary to implement screening here in Scotland, and I would agree with him on that. But could he explain to the Chamber what criteria he will use in, in his ongoing assessments and what would be, uh, need to happen before screening was considered necessary? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, can I say, in terms of point of entry screening, uh, the point of entry screening is already being done in London. I think I'm right in saying 85% of those who fly in indirectly from these West African countries come through Heathrow, uh, and the balance come from Gatwick and through St Pancras in London. So there's very comprehensive screening there. However, we are in regular touch both with the Scotland office and with the Department of Health, in particular the Public Health Minister, Jane Ellison, uh, and the, obviously they have been through an exercise down there as well to establish whether they are going to extend screening to regional airports in England uh, and there is a set of criteria and an assessment methodology for doing that and we are working with them and we will keep that situation under review. Uh, at the moment, I think I'm right in saying that there is a, no additional screening in the regional airports in England yet, although there has been some consideration to it, but there's very clear criteria and assessment. And I say, as I say, I and myself and Mr Matheson would be happy to send more details to the member because uh, it would take me quite a while to get through all those criteria and those uh, assessments. Gil Patterson and finally Patricia Ferg. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, said guidance has been sent to health professionals to ensure they are equipped to deal with the suspected cases. What information will be provided to pharmacists, particularly on recognising potential cases? Cabinet Secretary. Pres Presiding Officer, the Acting Chief Medical Officer, as well as the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, uh, are informing through various sources, particularly the health boards, the pharmacy industry as well, of uh, anything that they need to be aware of, so that uh, and everybody involved in medical care, health care of any type in Scotland are fully aware of what the signs are, what the risks are, and what the procedures are, should they suspect anyone uh, having Ebola. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his very comprehensive statement and can I agree with him when he says in that statement that the best way for us to protect the public health in Scotland is to support the efforts underway in West Africa? And having recently visited Cameroon and having been screened on entry to that country, I can testify to the seriousness with which the countries in West Africa are taking this particular outbreak. And I applaud the funding and supplies made available by the Scottish Government. But the task of fighting Ebola is falling to countries that struggle continually to provide a health service to their citizens in the normal course of events. And I wonder whether the Scottish Government might be looking at ways of helping to provide assistance to those West African countries most affected to sustain the health services that the people within those countries need in their daily lives. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, as I said in my statement, we've already uh, shipped out £300,000 worth of aprons and masks and so on, but um, we're not just a, you know, it's not just what's in store in Lark Hall for the NHS in Scotland that we're shipping. We're working to a list prepared by the Department for International Development, and that, the, the priority at the moment is for stuff required to deal with Ebola in hospitals and clinics in the affected countries. I think once we've broken the back of that, then we'll look at the longer term situation where we can help. We've already sent money, we sent half a million pounds through the World Health Organization, but rather than us trying to reinvent the wheel, we're working through the established international organizations, which are the World Health Organization, and obviously we're working very closely with DFID and with Oxfam, indeed others. We will respond to the Oxfam request very positively as well. And where a request comes in for longer term assistance, then clearly Mr. Uh, Yousaf uh, and Mr. Matheson together will do, and myself, will do what we can to provide anything we possibly can to help these people because their health service is uh, pretty primitive, quite frankly, uh, in these affected countries. And indeed, uh, I've asked uh, both Mr. Matheson and Mr. Yousaf, along with a small number of officials, at uh, the appropriate time uh, to visit West Africa and identify any additional help that we can provide from Scotland, because I agree with the member, we should be doing everything we can, not just to help them over this Ebola crisis, but also to provide uh, as much help as we can to avoid it happening again and to help them build up a better healthcare system in all their countries. My apologies to the two members that I was unable to call. Uh, we move to the next side of business, which is a debate on motion number 11301. In the name of Nicola Sturgeon, on Scotland Evolution Commission, the Smith Commission. Members who